So you can see on screen uh, one of my favorite presenters. I say that because I've had the pleasure of working with her all summer, and I'm quite excited by the fact she's back in Oxford again next week. But if you haven't met uh, Charlotte, Charlotte Rance is a teacher, trainer, and consultant who uh, is from Brighton, but we won't hold that bit against her. After two Thank decades you. in ELT, <laughs> Charlotte brings knowledge and experience from her classroom practice and roles, including school management, educational sales, and materials development. Charlotte is an author of professional development courses and has contributed to a number of publications, including teachers' book, education blogs, and journals. Her area of focus is is promoting student-centered learning uh, and as a trainer she aims to provide practical strategies that teachers can really use in her free time she has the best hobby because like me she plays board games True. so uh, she is here <laughs> not to talk about board games unfortunately but she is going to talk about the very interesting and, and on trend topic assessment for learning so block two of l of l talk chapter three begins over to you, Charlotte. Thank you, Sean, for that lovely introduction. And hello to everybody in the chat box. Um, we're going to start with a bit of chat box interaction, hopefully. So, um, yeah, let's, let's have a look at this little quote we have here. Take a minute to read it through. And in the chat box, do you agree or disagree with this quote? If you agree or disagree, what do you think it means to you? How would you feel about this quote? It's, um, it's one that speaks to me. I was never really a great exam taker. Um, <laughs> so, so for me, yeah, I often felt like, like I've done many tests and exams, but more often they were done to me. I didn't feel particularly active in that. Um, yeah, let's see. Ooh, the chat box is moving so fast. So many people. So a few agrees coming through. A few agrees coming through. Excellent. I hate exams more than my students. Oh, isn't that just the case? Isn't that just the case? Yeah, lots and lots and lots of agreement here. Um, my goodness, this moves fast, doesn't it? Trying to catch the words and uh, yeah, difficult to see as they fly past, but I'm definitely sensing large amounts of agreement happening here. What does this mean? What does this mean to me? I think what it says to me is that quite often, especially when we think about standardised testing, students have little control over what they're doing. Students have little choice over when, where, how they take tests in exams. Um, sometimes they even have little control over the exams that they're taking. And they don't have a lot of choice. It's the same exam for everybody, regardless of ability, regardless of um, their, you know, their experiences, their past experiences with exams. Quite often, these exams were done to us. It's not necessarily very student-centred. So, what are we doing today? Well, we are here to kick off block two with a chat about assessment for learning. And of course, we're going to start by establishing what that means. We're then going to be looking at what we mean by bridging the gap. And you may have noticed it was there in the subtitle of this session. And finally, we're going to end with some practical applications, a little starter pack for assessment for learning, if you like. Um, ways that we can get those ideas going in our classroom. So, what is assessment for learning? I'm sure that we have a wealth of different levels of experience with assessment for learning in here. So if you do want to share your interpretation in the chat box, go right ahead. Um, let's, let's get a few ideas coming in if I can read them, my speed reading. <laughs> um, yeah, what is assessment for learning? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? And I think that we can all agree. Well, there we go. There's a great word coming out from Fatu there. Thank you. Formative assessment. Formative, indeed. Formative because it forms our 
progression. It forms our abilities. Um, it forms adaptations that we make to the way that we behave, the way that we learn, and all sorts of other things. Um, Eugenia, interaction. Lovely word. Yeah, there, there needs to be some sort of, I might even take the inter off the beginning, action. It, it's an active process. Um, a few other wonderful, wonderful ideas coming through. Keyword feedback coming through from Bojena there. Lovely. Um, autonomy from Anna Lucia, Louisa, Anna Luisa, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's another great word. And I think one of the easiest ways to, to get an understanding of what assessment for learning is, is to start by thinking about what it's not. And what it isn't is assessment of learning. Assessment of learning, the end product of what we're doing. Um, so what we can say about assessment of learning is that it's summative. It happens at the end of the learning process. It happens after all of the input. It happens at the end of the unit, at the end of the academic year, um, when you have finished your IELTS course or whatever exam you're taking. Summative assessment is designed to happen at the end of that learning process. And quite often it happens in a formal setting. Um, there will be potentially a whole group of people sitting in a room taking the same test, um, filling out the same questions and answers, and usually done under exam conditions. We all know what that means. Silence in the room, no opportunity to ask questions. Um, yeah, it's a formal process. And of course, because it's a formal process, it often has high stakes outcomes as well. Um, passing that exam might be the difference between moving on to your university or not. It might be the, uh, the opportunity to move up a level in your language school. It might mean a raise if you're an adult uh, speaker, having having that leveled certificate that states my English is here might push you higher into your own into your job to the next level of um, management, etc. And essentially, what it means is it forms the basis of grading throughout the education process. And it's an important tool when it comes to reporting achievements, recording achievements. I think it's fair to say that assessment of learning will continue throughout my lifetime, probably all of yours as well, in some way, shape or form. But it's not the only model of assessment we also can talk about assessment for learning. And of course, this is in contrast to that. So assessment for learning is formative. We've seen that word coming out in the chat box time and time again so far already. What does that mean? It is designed to help improvement happen. As such, it doesn't take place at the end of the learning process. When we test at the end of the learning process, often it's too late to make any adaptations or changes. So formative assessment happens continuously throughout that learning process. Um, in fact, it's often you know, referred to as continuous assessment, maybe learner-oriented assessment. We can hear all of these phrases around it as well. And it's, it's a process for helping learners to understand, helping learners to understand what they already know, what they can already do. But not only that, what they need to learn to progress to that next stage, the strategies that will help them to achieve that. Assessment for learning is embedded into everyday teaching and learning. Um, as Cecilia has pointed out in the chat box, it happens through diverse tools. It's not always the same paper to the same person. It might encompass project work. It could be presentations. There might well be an element of choice in there. Um, you know, and, and it's not always a very formal methodology. 
discussions, questioning, debates, as we're going to see after this session, um, reflection, feedback, these are all part of the assessment for learning process. And as such, AFL, Assessment for Learning, focuses on the process of learning. Um, yeah, it may well involve Kahoot. Why not? Kahoot is a great, quick understanding test tool. Brilliant. Um, and as Rahaf has said here, it, it may well be personalized as well. So now let's have a look at what this actually means in practical terms here. If we look at a traditional assessment model, it usually follows quite a linear process. We start with input. We teach them something. Um, from the input, which of course comes in many shapes and forms, we typically from the teacher or from the course book, maybe in a more ambitious classroom, it comes from discovery or learning. The evidence is then collected, evidence of learning, evidence from exams, potentially from other sources such as. Um, uh, such as observation, for example. So teacher monitoring and note taking could be part of that evidence gathering. That evidence that we collect from our students is then compared to that criteria, the assessment criteria. Does the evidence we have collected demonstrate that the criteria have been met? The teacher is very much in control of this as a model. Um, the students aren't often you know, able to provide input to the assessment criteria. They typically are standardized. Um, you know, the, the student may well have little information about those assessment criteria. And aside from knowing they need to answer as many questions correctly as possible, they might not have a great understanding of what that test is involving. And that is a very typical assessment model. Of course, assessment for learning flips that on its head. And what you'll notice when I bring um, this, this alternative uh, formal uh, formulation of a model, um, the learner here is right in the centre of this. So this is an alternative approach to assessment, puts the student right there in the middle. And what we can see here, those arrows in the centre demonstrate to us that the learning and assessment process is being done with those learners. Um, the model offers four stages. So essentially at the beginning, we've got that goal setting element, um, setting those learning goals. The student is involved in that. What do they want to achieve? What do they need to work on? What are their ambitions? The evidence collection again takes place with the learner. And as we've already said, this might be quite an informal process. Um, it, it could be anything really at all that we would like it to be. Um, and then of course, the judgment happens. Now that judgment, again, it happens with the learner. It's not the teacher is the source of feedback. We are looking at the learner engaging in reflection for themselves, potentially peer feedback, giving feedback to each other. And also, of course, then we move on to the next steps we learn from that uh, feedback, we learn from that judgment. So those next steps will come out of those judgments, those decisions on what needs to improve, which gaps need to be filled. Um, and of course, then those next steps feed into further goals. We then collect evidence and the process continues moving around. As we already said, it is a continuous process. As Gabriella puts it, it's a cycle, absolutely. And it, and it happens, we go through those stages constantly, constantly. So what we can say also about assessment for learning is that it is based on some core principles. 10 core principles. Now, I do thoroughly recommend, um, you'll see a link on the screen here, 
visiting the pages of the assessment reform group. So the assessment reform group are a team of um, academics and assessment experts who developed, um, I, let's say, collated all of the ideas behind assessment for learning, because I think it's fair to say that assessment for learning is not in any way, shape or form a new idea. And, and often we're already doing many of the things we need to do as teachers just through instinct. But those 10 principles of AFL come out nice and neat and tidy. So we're looking things at the top um, with ideas such as assessment for learning is part of your planning. As a teacher, you plan uh, your assessment into your lessons. Um, it's, let's say, rather than being you know reactive it's intentional there is a plan there it focuses on how the students learn um, and it is central to classroom practice it's also a key professional skill for teachers state the assessment reform group um, it is part of our job as teachers to guide and provide that guidance and it's also sensitive and constructive in terms of its feedback and its delivery. We can also see that they state that AFL should foster motivation within the students. It should promote those learning goals and criteria, help them to know how it is to improve um, and develop a student's capacity, their ability for self-assessment, enabling them to be able to make their own judgments of their own learning and recognises all educational achievement, not just whether or not you have passed the exam at the end of the academic year. So, um, which row, top row or bottom row is of more concern to teachers? Just give me a top or a bottom in the chat box. Uh, Liam, that's an excellent question. I will ask the people in the mod or the moderators if they can pop Liam's question into the q and A. I'd like to park that for now and come back to that later. I think it's a really important question. Um, yeah. Okay. So, a few answers. Where are the teachers? So, most of the most of the um, items on the top row they're about teaching practice. They're about how we deliver this. Whereas the bottom row is there focusing on the student needs. Um, but as we can see, it's a nice sort of guidance for what happens in the classroom. And I do recommend after this session, well, after everybody's sessions today or tomorrow or another lovely day, go off and explore the assessment reform group pages. Um, not only do they have some great resources, they've got a lot of wonderfully interesting research that backs up all of their findings as well. Okay, so we've said that assessment for learning is designed to bridge the gap. But let's think about what that um, means for everybody. So gonna give you a little question once again in the chat box. Can you give me an answer? For those of you that have used assessment for learning processes, what benefits have you seen? For those of you that are new to it, judging by what you have seen, what are the benefits of assessment for learning in our classrooms? Anything that you think might well be beneficial. So Natalia is coming straight in with motivation and I might actually jump back to um, Liam's question at this point. So Liam asked us um, what we can do when the students are not um, not motivated to participate in assessment. And I think quite often the answer to that is that they don't understand the value or the, the worth of being part of that process. Often students um, get used to 
being assessed, having little control, um, and and not really understanding the purposes behind it. And assessment, of course, as we mentioned, is often considered high stakes, high pressure. Stress levels can um, can really increase when it comes to taking exams and tests. So so quite often our students will get um, quite. Uh, a strong reaction to the word assessment. But when we can discuss those um, reasons behind it, when we think with our students about what the benefits are and, and they understand why we might be using assessment for learning in our classroom, those motivation levels can really increase. Um, Ionella, yeah, is student involvement, and I'm sure quite a few other people have, have popped that one in there as well. Um, that engagement, that involvement, absolutely. Self-confidence, what a lovely, lovely word there. And, and just being able to be aware that you have the tools to be able to help yourself to improve. You don't need the teacher. There it is, Huma, with autonomy there. Absolutely. Improvement motivation. What a great, great, great load of words and phrases we're getting in here. I wish I could read them all. Um, yeah, so when I was putting together this session, I sort of boiled it down, I think, to, to four key things. And these four things have all come out in the, the chat box here already. Um, we see increased motivation, um, emphasis on progress, emphasis on achievement, emphasis on being able to see where you have come from, where you have got to, and having a plan to take you to where you need to be is in and of itself motivational, especially when you are working with older students, um, with teenagers, with adults. This is an incredibly powerful tool for motivation. Um, it also enables our students to take that ownership of learning, being part of the goal setting, being part of identifying your assessment criteria and choosing those. Um, it allows people to take control of their learning, to make the progress that they want to do and to feel that agency. Yeah, as Elena has said, learner agency is absolutely key here. Um, and, and for those of you that might not be familiar with the term learner agency, that just means that the students have control, a level of control, a level of ownership, a level of decision making within their um, own learning experiences. Confidence, many of you have said um, being able to self-assess gives you the confidence to identify the mistakes that you're making and allow you to take control of that learning. And of course, we've seen this keyword come in a lot. It's that active role. S exams are no longer being done to you. You are part of that assessment process. It is being done with you rather than to you. Um, yeah, lots of lovely comments coming in as well. Um, ah, Alvaro, good question. Yes, I mean, I would start absolutely with the link on the previous slide. Lots and lots and lots of great research done by the assessment reform group will, will inform quite a lot of that. But there is a lot of literature out there about all of these key benefits. Um, so what does that mean to, to our students? What does that mean? And this is a lovely, a lovely quote. Um, and I would recommend having a look at this book as well, Fast and Effective Assessment. Um, it's, a, it's a great guide of how assessment for learning, uh, assessment for learning is applied within classrooms as well. And this quote, I think, speaks to me, you know, when our students get their work back, quite often the first thing they ask is, what's my grade? 
first thing they do, check their grade, turn to the person next to you. You know, what did you get? What did you get? Oh, I did better than last time, worse than last time. What assessment for learning is aiming to do is to change that question. Rather than immediately asking, what did I get? We need them to be thinking, what happens next? How do I build from here? What should I work on next? Taking the um, taking the idea that your grade, your assessment result, is not the end of the situation. It is a stepping stone in a process. Um, learning from what we have experienced and building on that to the, to the future. And as, as Hina says, this is this is that absolute basic problem. And it's it's something that we've all experienced. Every single one of us as students have felt that, you know, what did I get? What does that mean for me? But each assessment is, as Monica has phrased it, a chance to improve. And I think that that is an important thing to remember. Of course, what we're seeing here is that the student is being cast in an active role. Um, it's all about self-regulation of learning, really. And if you understand what you know, if you understand where you're trying to get to, you become a more powerful learner. So what does that mean to the teacher? What does that mean for us? If the students are taking an active role, what are we doing? We've, we, are, we are giving up some of that control that we've had on the assessment. What does the role of the teacher then become? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Liberation. Oh, if only Lucille. <laughs> if only. If only. Uh, so, yeah, as Panar puts it, process based learning. Excellent. Ah, Sophie, lovely. A coach, facilitator. Absolutely. We assist. We're a partner. We're a moderator. We're a guide. Absolutely. We are there with the flags, showing the students where to go, handing them some strategies and supporting their learning. Now, most of us as teachers find ourselves already doing those things. Um, I think it's fair to say that most students want, uh, most teachers want their students to improve and we are naturally inclined to do everything we can to make that happen. So quite often what we need to do to support assessment for learning practices in our classroom is pretty much what we were doing anyway. Often it just means making a little change. Now, as some of you have already um, pointed out in the chat box, the level of control that we can give to our students is varied depending on the school that we are working in, the environment that we teach in, um, the, the type of course, etc. Some of these things we may not be able to change. But what we can see on the screen here is a group of situations. So on the left hand side in the blue, we've got the, um, the traditional assessment processes. On the right with the white background, what we can see here are some small tweaks and changes that we can make to our own um, classroom practice that will move ourselves towards assessment for learning. So I'm going to set you some homework. Um, I promise I will never check if you have done it. <laughs> so if you do, it is up to you. Um, but yeah, have a look at the column on the left. Maybe take a photo of the slide. You will get the oh, you will get the 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 content through at the end, so you will be able to come back to this. But have a look at the column on the left, and for your own um, future practice, pick one thing that you think you can give some control over. So, learning goals might not be the one that you can pick on, but Maybe reflection 
is something that you could improve. Maybe you could take yourself from the teacher reflects on whether the lesson is successful to providing opportunities for the learners to reflect. And that's your uh, that's your homework. Gabriella says done already. Fantastic. <laughs> How was that experience? Um, it can be challenging for both the teacher and for the students as well, because quite often when we try to introduce opportunities for student reflection, we have to teach them how to do it. Um, it's not a it's not a natural skill. It's something that, that comes through. OK. All right. Uh, Lucille's going to have a go on the fourth one. Um, yeah. Assessments. Introducing more peer and self-assessment. Well, let's see if we can find some tools to get you uh, get you going on some of the right hand columns. Yeah. OK. Um, Ooh, doo -doo 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 so many questions coming through. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing the Q and A box at the end of this. I'm sure we're not going to be able to get through all of them. Um, yeah. Okay. So there's your homework. Choose one thing. See if you can make one small change. Um, and I promise I will never check if you've done your homework. But let's spend the next few minutes talking about some of my favorite little getting started, uh, getting started activities. So first thing that I want to um, talk to you about is questioning in the classroom. It is a small obsession of mine. Um, I love questions. I ask a lot of questions and I love my students to ask questions too. But of course, as we know, um, question and answer sessions in a classroom can often feel a little bit like a game of tennis. Teacher versus individuals in the class. You ask a question, up goes the ball, bat the ball to the student, student bats an answer back at you, you bounce a student, to bounce a question to the other student and it comes back and you ask another student and it comes back. Um, and to continue our analogy here, we don't really want to see tennis in our questioning. We want to see basketball. We want to see football. We want to see insert team sport of your choice here. Um, so this is a technique called question bouncing. Um, it goes by other names as well, but, but I, I learned it as the question bouncing technique. And it's a useful tool for opening up classroom discussion, encouraging peer feedback. And as you can see through the questions on the prompts here, it, um, it involves encouraging discussion. Now, at the beginning, it might feel a bit strange to your students. Um, they are very used to the tennis processes. Answer a question like ping pong, as Amal says. Indeed, they are very used to that. So at the beginning, it, it might be useful to ask questions such as this. So I ask Carlos a question. Carlos gives me an answer. My next question is, Isla, what did you think of Carlos's answer? Ali gives me an answer. I turn to Henri and say, Henri, can you add anything to this idea, to Ali's idea? Now, what's happening here? Well, number one, we're encouraging our students to listen to each other. Um, one thing that I like to do is to, you know, if, if my students turn around, and, oh, I didn't hear what he said, get the student to repeat. Um, yeah. make sure that they are being encouraged to listen to each other and to add on to different ideas. Um, these follow-up questions, as someone has just pointed out in the chat box, do increase your teach talk time, absolutely, but no more so than saying, okay, you know, Isla, what about you? Henri, what about you? What do you think? Um, but the good news is that by using these prompt questions, you can start to reduce the necessity for you to speak. Because the more often that you do this with your class, the more often they get used to um, 
responding and adding further information. Yeah, thank you, Huma. It is useful, DTD. Absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, as they get used to the technique, they will become more independent. You can take those questions away. You can just leave a pause. You know, Carlos gives an answer. Don't say anything at all. Wait for someone else to fill in, to respond. As Safa says, waiting time is a must. So yeah, question bouncing. Um, Go, change your life. It is a it is a wonderful, wonderful tool. And as we can see, you know, from, from this, it is encouraging that interaction between the students, but it is encouraging peer feedback. It's encouraging reflection and encouraging that independence. In the meantime, as teachers, we can listen, we can monitor, and we can add our feedback in most of the time. Bayan says, I do that most of the time. Thumbs up to Bayan. Yeah, many of these things we are already doing automatically, so it's important to think. What about a, what about the situation where no one wants to speak, says Luminita? Um, my tool for that is silence. As a teacher, if you are silent long enough, your students get uncomfortable and will say something. <laughs> That's my top tip. I don't know. If you can't get your students to speak, don't fill the gap. Just say nothing and wait till someone does. Um, yeah. Okay. So the next technique is an immediate feedback technique, and it's a technique called fist to five. There is your little five. There's your fist. And this is a technique for providing instantaneous feedback what I might do is um, give my students a vocabulary box, for example. And I would say to my students, OK, what I want you to do is look at those words in that vocabulary box. And I'd like you to give them each a number. Give it a one if you have never seen this word before. Give me a two if you've seen the word, but you're not really sure what it means. Give you a three if you've used it before, but you're not entirely certain you used it properly. Uh, give me a four if you're confident in your speaking or writing, and a five if you've used it confidently in speaking and writing. And what we can do is we can just say, okay, um, who, you know, show me on your hand, like, what are you scoring this word? How familiar is this to you? Um, one of the things I like about this technique is that it encourages the idea of progress and depth of understanding. One of the things I hate to hear from my teacher, my students is, teacher, I've done this. Teacher, we learnt this yesterday. And I always say to them, you know, you're, you're going to be facing the same grammar, the same vocabulary thousands and thousands of times over before you finish learning English. We forget things. Um, you know, there's a depth of understanding. You might have seen it before, but it doesn't mean you can use it in all contexts. You might know how to spell it, but you might not how to pronounce it. So let's give it a go. Think about your fist to five. One, two, three, four. I'm going to give you some nice words. I've chosen some challenging ones off the academic word list here. So six words in the chat box. Um, are any of these a one to you? Are any of these a three to you? Are any of these a five to you? Um, for me, I've included it in there. I don't think I would say I'm a five on empirical. I'm not entirely certain what it means. I've seen it in writing. <laughs> I don't think I would be able to use it confidently in speech and feel like I know how to say it. All right. Um, ah, adjacent. There we go. There's a, there's a, it's an entirely pointless word. It just means next to. Um, but we have adjacent. Why not? Too many words in English. OK, so, yeah, as we can see, even even in a group of English teachers, not all of them are going to be a five for everyone. Um, and there is there is a depth of knowledge and a depth of learning. And again, what we're seeing here is an opportunity for the students to self-assess. 
but also to understand that they can make a progress through that. You know, <laughs> yeah, it might be as someone has put an adjacent to, you know, we might not know the full grammar of a word. So it might stop us getting a five because we might not be confident to use it in our writing, for example. But what we can also say here is that it gives us opportunities to expand our um our student to student learning, our peer learning opportunities. Because what I can do is say, okay, all right, you've given each of your words a number, one, two, three, four, five. Go find someone in the classroom that has scored a five on the words you are a one at and learn from them. And then I, as the teacher, can come back in afterwards and fill in the gaps, bridge the gaps of that knowledge. Okay, woo, moving on. Now, um, here on the screen is an example of a peer editing checklist. And I think that um, peer feedback, uh, student to student feedback is a huge challenge for many students, especially the first time that they, um, they come into contact with it. If they're asked to give feedback on a peer, they don't necessarily know how to do that. They might not know how to give effective feedback. They may not know what effective feedback looks like. Maybe they don't want to upset or offend their friends. So they will give positive feedback only and not constructive feedback. Um, I am sorry if it, if it doesn't come out very clear. You don't need to read it. What you are looking at here is an example of a peer editing checklist for a project. And the, um, the framework that this provides is really, really useful for students. What we're talking about here, rather than this specific item, is the concept of checklists. Checklists provide a framework for students. And checklists are often built off uh, the criteria of whatever task we're doing. So in this case here, we're looking at a checklist, which is just a tick, 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 yes or no. Did they achieve this thing? We've got points such as the project includes all the information. The information shared is factual. It is referenced. Um, it includes visuals to support the information shared. And what you can also see here is a little blank space at the end. Now, when students become more confident, we can hand over more and more of that control. Um, so when you get uh, to a stage where they're used to using a checklist to give feedback to each other, you might want to start leaving blank spaces for them to put their own um, checkpoints in there. Yeah, Lydia says she loves to use checklists. They are very effective, as Shamima says. Yep, rubrics, but a student accessible rubric. Often the rubrics that we get for tasks for assessment, they're written in very, very teacher language. The key to an effective checklist is to make sure it's in language the student can understand. Um, and what you can do then is point out that this is a guidance, it's a framework, it's allowing for um, the students to take more ownership and responsibility. In turn, that frees up our time. You know, your checklist might have the most simple basic things on it. So, you know, the spelling and grammar are correct. Tick. Great, that's one thing less I need to provide feedback on. But it's a way for students to get involved in that feedback process to take more ownership of their learning and um, yeah, to, to build and improve. When we do this, of course, we need to take a lot of things into consideration. Um, peer feedback takes time. We need to plan when this is going to occur in the class, how much time the process is likely to take. Um, the more unfamiliar that learners are with peer-to-peer -peer feedback, the longer the process is likely to take. The more confident they get with it, the easier it will become. Um, practice makes 
perfect, maybe, let's say. And, and of course, you know, it, it, it requires the students to have an understanding of the task, of the expectations of the task, but also enough confidence to be able to comment on it. So things that, that you might include, especially at the beginning, will be more of the um, examples like number two, the colour scheme and font are consistent throughout the project. Visual points. They might not have the strength of language to be able to comment on grammar, to be able to comment on spelling. Yeah. So, yeah, we're we're going to we're going to allow them then to to give feedback on the things that they are confident in doing. Okay. <laughs> now, yeah, as as Sophie says, they they often affirm this because they don't see each other's mistakes. Yeah. All right. Uh, Francesco says practice makes almost perfect. I always like to think that practice makes permanent. Um, it might not make perfect, but it's a great way to build habits and good behaviors. So um, conscious that we're getting to the end and we're going to end with a little um, very popular assessment for learning technique. The assessment for learning technique that we're looking at here is the concept of the exit tickets. Um, and again, this is a self-assessment tool. So the way, well, one of the ways that exit tickets can be used is the way that I like to do them. Um, at the end of the lesson, students walk out the door and they hand me their exit ticket. Now, I like to give my students choice when it comes to their exit tickets. So what I would do here is I would ask them to give me one of three things, either to provide me a summary of the lesson on that post-it. Um, if they are confident that they've understood everything, then they can give me a summary and I can use that summary to check any misunderstandings, any um any any problems or errors that might have come up, their summary gives me a summary. When I ask them to answer a question, I might put a question on the board and I'll ask them to write their answer to that question. Or option three, I might ask them to ask me a question that they still have to wrap up that lesson. So over to you in the chat box. <laughs> As a, <laughs> yeah, uh, Elizabeth, I think that was a lovely point. You prepare, you, you're better when you get the student feedback, it enables you to do more. So let's have an exit check, uh, an exit ticket from my session in the chat box. In the chat box, either give me a summary of this workshop, um, answer the question, what is the one thing you want to remember tomorrow? Or give me your own question in the chat box as well. Let's see what we've got. Any summaries that we're coming through? Uh, Graciela, how to make feedback less time consuming? Um, I don't know. I think it actually goes. It, it, feedback, feedback should take time and time should be given to feedback. Feedback needs time. Um, and I think that the best thing to do, rather than think about how we can make it less time consuming, think about how we can use that time better. So how can we, um, how can we ensure that there's real time for quality feedback? And often the question of that is, do we need to give feedback? And that's a question for a whole other session. But yeah, uh, so several people have said the answer is fist to five. Fantastic. If that's the one thing you want to take away, brilliant. Um, let me go over to the chat box. I heard somebody crackling in the background, moderators. Was someone coming to join me? <laughs> let me see what's going on in the Q&A box. Ooh. All right. Oh, so many lessons. Uh, so many questions. <laughs> Ekaterina asks, have you ever had a class where your ideas didn't work? How did you cope with it? <laughs> um, yes, Ekaterina, I am a teacher and I have had 
many, many classes where my ideas didn't work. Um, and I will continue to have those um, every day for the rest of my career, I'm sure. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we make ourselves a nice cup of tea because you cannot teach without tea. And then we sit down and we reflect on that. Um, you know, so, so, you know, think about what went wrong. Ask yourself, why do I think this go went wrong? Ask your students if you can. Why do you think this went wrong? What was the problem here? Gather as much information as you possibly can and then go back to the drawing board. Start over. Um, Valicia has asked, how long does the exit activity typically last? What I tend to do when I'm using it is I give them five minutes at the end of the lesson um, as an absolute maximum. Put that, uh, put that to, to the test. So you put your question on the board, or you set up your activity verbally, and then they write their answer and they give that to you as they are walking out the door. Um, <laughs> how do you change students' mindsets about assessment? Um, so I think that that relates back to the question that came up earlier. And number one, you're not going to change every student's mindset. We know this. Um, and when you can, you will, um, you will, you know, when you can change a student's mindset, it's a great victory for us as a teacher. But um, yeah, you know, as you as you say, students often make that immediate connection between assessment and so the one thing that I like to do is just to keep trying nothing. Um, make sure that you, know, you are sharing that information as much as you can. Make sure the un students understand. That. I think the key thing, especially if you're working with older students, is to show them the value. Give them opportunities to reflect on that. Charlotte, well, I think um, there are um, the the uh, Q and A. You're you're looking at the bottom of the Q and A. I don't know if you realise you have to scroll. Uh -huh. There are hundreds of questions. Oh my goodness! So okay. many, Sorry. <laughs> so many. Um, so it's scrolling up. Am I, Sean? Uh, yeah. So the the. Yes. Okay. Now I'm looking at the now I'm looking at the times. I can see them. Um, all right. So, ooh, so many questions. Uh, so, oop, hang on. Let's go with yeah. Well, the one I've got on the bottom of my uh, Q and A here is, um, what do you do when you apply the techniques, but the students' responses are plain and do not show enthusiasm? you start over, you go back to the drawing board again. It's it's a case of, um, yeah, just keep reflecting as a teacher. And I think that's really the most important thing. And and I do argue, um, and I'll be interested to see what, what comes out in the debate next, that, um, you know, even with our very youngest learners, it's, it's possible for them to give feedback and to... Um, to, to get them at a level, whether that happens in their L1, whether it's just colouring in a smiley face about how they feel of that things, you know, what what can we do to get their feedback and their input? Because at the end of the day, the students are the centre of everything we are doing. And if it's not working for them, then we need to change something. Um, ooh, do, 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 do. Let's see. Um, there are lots of questions coming out about motivations. A few questions coming out about weak students. Um, so, so again, you know, that, yes, we have students who have different strengths to each other. Um, and the problem with standardized assessment, of course, is that it's one exam for everybody. Um, whereas with a you know, formative assessment and that goes on throughout the learning process, we have the ability to be quite flexible with that. Um, 
So, you know, wherever possible, providing choice. Um, you know, students might, let's say, let's say I've asked them to answer the question of, you know, uh, what's the weather like in your town? There we go. That's a perfectly, perfectly sensible question to ask. Now, what I might say to my students to enable them to have choice, if I'm, if I'm going to use more of an assessment for learning process, might, um, might allow me to provide them choices in the way they can deliver that answer. So maybe some students might um, make a poster some students might make a recording maybe some students will give me a presentation someone might want to write a story about it or a, or a paragraph about it and providing choice will enable students to choose the things that they consider to be their strengths and every student has different strengths so as much as possible when it comes to assessment for learning um, is to 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 provide opportunities for the students to show us what they can do and to help them set their own targets. Um, I did notice that there have been a few questions on, you know, standardized testing is a part of life. Um, you know, how can we how can we get past this? I think the answer to that is we can't. It's part of life. Assessment for learning isn't a replacement for standardized testing. I, I, I haven't listened to the debate yet. Maybe my mind will change, but I'm kind of a bit of the um, no standardized testing type uh, thinking already. We will see. Um, but what we need to be thinking is, you know, how can how can we stop assessment being just the end of the process? How can we embed it into our teaching as well? Um, can we use tests for fluency assessment? Yes, um, we absolutely can. <laughs> um, I think that, that, you know, the, the, the speaking test in and of itself can be quite a, a scary process for the students but what you will um, discover if you go away and explore some more assessment for learning techniques um, a lot of it is very discursive and there's lots of talking that happens and a lot of fluency that comes out so yeah yeah definitely um yeah. Students do not learn in the same way. How do I manage to assess them based on their abilities when the exam is standardised? Ah, oh, Samar, that's the question teachers have been asking for a really, really long time. Um, and and when it comes to standardised assessment, I don't think they there is an answer yet. Um, certainly, there's not an answer from me on that. Um, as I said, you know, I was... I was not a good test taker in school. Um, never liked exams. I, I don't deal well with the pressure. So my, my exam results are always below where my teacher's predictions of me would be. Um, there's, there is no, <laughs> there's no answer to, to how can we make standardized testing fit everybody, I don't think. I don't know. Maybe we'll maybe we'll learn something in the in the next um, next session there. <laughs> right. OK. Have we got time for one more? Let's see if we can find a juicy one. Oh, yes. Good pop up. Hello. Good pop up. Um, this pop up here in the corner of your screen. Do have a look at this. This is an excellent resource from OUP. Uh, it's uh, completely free to download. Effective feedback, key to successful assessment for learning. It's a position paper that talks about all sorts of really interesting things. A lot of, um, a lot of the research, a lot of the theory. And also some really practical tips in there as well. So, yeah, if you are interested in bringing a bit more assessment for learning into your classroom, download that <laughs> if it's still on your screen. Um, and if not, you know, a simple, a simple Google search of OUP and assessment for learning might bring you at least to the link.
Ooh, Allegra, let's go with that as a last question. Why not? With the youngest students who are barely literate, do you insist on exit tickets in English or is L1 also acceptable? Um, to me, L1 is acceptable, um, especially with low level students, whether they are young in age or late starters, late comers to English. You know, when you're asking people to reflect, we want them to be able to enable. So if you are in a monolingual classroom, I don't really, and you speak the same language that your students speak, I see no reason why they couldn't give you a summary of the lesson in their L1 or answer a question in the L1 or ask a question in the L1 as well. Um, you know, when it when it comes to reflection and exit tickets is is very much a, a reflection technique, then yeah, I would say that L1 is also acceptable.